to open your Bibles, if you would, please. And I'll see if my computer will stop um, being stuck. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17, if you would, please. You've got to be kidding me, sir. Did you find Matthew chapter 17? Yes. I'm sorry. I do need this thing today. I think my keyboard died on me is what happened. Okay, I'm going to use it manually. Let's see if we're up on the screen. Okay. <clears throat> Today, the devil tried to keep you from seeing all that I have for you. But he lost. Today I want to talk to you about, I've got a series that just takes two days, two Sundays. It's today and next Sunday. I want to talk to you about, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. I want to talk to you about when you actually are praying and you're believing and you know you believe in God. But you come to a place that sometimes that you're having trouble believing for something in your life. Many of us have been there. We have been to a place where we're asking God to do something in our life and it feels like we just don't have enough faith. Maybe someone's even told you that you haven't had enough faith. But what I'd like you to understand is there is a difference between believe, I'm uh, between faith and unbelief. Uh, I take this phrase, I believe, help my unbelief. I take it from a story in the Bible that we are going to be reading about. But the first thing I'd like you to see is um, the verse that is found in Mark chapter 9 verse 23 where it says here Jesus said to him if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes I want to let you know that faith and unbelief can exist at the same time that there are times where you actually believe God and there are times where you're, you're trusting in God but yet something just doesn't seem to get right something doesn't seem to happen have you ever prayed and asked God for something and it didn't happen I'd say all of us, right? Have you ever believed God for something big in life and you really thought that this was the will of God for your life, but yet it didn't take place? Any of you? Have any of you ever believed for anything big? Good. Five of you. Yes. And you believe for something big and, uh, and maybe it just didn't happen the way you thought it would. But I want to let you know that there is a difference between unbelief and faith. And that there are times in your life where you actually have both in your life. And it's, it is common. So I'm going to deal with it in the way we're, but I'd like you to understand this. It says this. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe, all things are possible. That's a huge statement. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, there's nothing impossible if you believe. Nothing can be, nothing can stop you to do whatever it is that you need to do for God or what God has asked you to do if you can believe. All things are possible to him who believes. Now, it also says in Hebrews 9 verse 13, excuse me, chapter 3 verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. This verse is taken from Hebrews chapter 3 which tells the story of the people of Israel. The people of Israel were taken out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses, brought, into the, brought to the Jordan River to go across the Jordan River into the promised land, and they sent 12 spies in there. And 10 spies came back and said, oh, it's horrible, it's horrible, there are giants in the land. And two guys came back and said, we can take the land, it's okay. God is with us, we can do it. The crowd, the group of people, all the masses went with the ten and they got afraid and they did not believe in God. Therefore, they never entered into what God had planned for them. And the Bible records it as unbelief. The reason they didn't enter into it is they had unbelief. Very important story that I hope to get back to because it's very important that you understand what they saw stopped them from believing. What they heard stopped them from believing. 
What they analyzed stopped them from believing. They looked at what was going on right in front of them in real life and said it's not possible. And that's the part that we need to deal with in our lives. In what I would like you to understand is that unbelief can exist in your life. In fact, the presence of unbelief is not proof that there's no faith, no more than the presence of anger is the proof that there's no love. Do you love anybody in your life? Well, mom and dad love this little, little baby that we just dedicated, little Logan. You, you know, I mean, they love that. Do you love that little baby? Yes, that little baby. Has that little baby ever gotten you angry? Yeah, and mom's going, yeah. Is the anger the, is proof that there is no love? Did the love leave? No, the love didn't leave, but there was just anger because of, you know, I mean, kids can do that to parents. Doesn't matter their age. It, it doesn't stop when they get older. <laughs> And older, and older. <laughs> anyway, God loves us, but there are times God has been angry. There are lots of times where you have faith, but you also have unbelief at the same time. In fact, all of us are dealing all the time with faith and unbelief in our lives, constantly. And you have to deal with the unbelief in order for you to believe. Jesus made the statement, if you have faith as the great of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed and be plucked up off the, off the ground and the land and be cast into the sea and it would obey you. Okay, Jesus said that's mustard seed faith. Now, we understand, you know, from the process of mustard seed is a little tiny, Jesus even communicated this, a little tiny seed that grows into a great big plant, which means that faith is constantly growing. Faith is growing and growing and growing. But if we look at that, if we realize that we already have mustard seed faith because faith was given to us even at our conversion, at our salvation. When we said yes to Jesus, the Bible says we have a gift of faith that he's given us the, the gift of faith. And so he's already given us faith to operate. Even our faith is a grace of God, a work of God. And so we know that we have faith. We know that we believe, but at the same time, we have other stuff that's going on inside our lives where it causes us not to believe. In Psalm 78, verse 41, it says this, Yes, again and again, they tempted God. These are the people in the wilderness that we talked about. And they limited the Holy One of Israel. Did you know that your unbelief can limit God in your life? You can actually put limits on God because of your unbelief. You can believe God and also not believe at the exact same time. You can have faith in God, but not believe. I know a lot of people who, um, they, they're totally fine with believing God and asking God to, to heal their body and pray for their healing and see God heal them. But when it comes to believe God to tithe or to bless uh, another person with some finances or bless the church or be committed in giving on a regular basis, they struggle. Now, why do they do that at the same time? Unbelief and belief are operating inside you constantly. So here's the question. What is unbelief and where does it come from? And that's what I want to talk about today. And then I also want to get into next week how to deal with it, how to get it out of your life, how to minimize your unbelief, how to reduce it, how to overcome it. And one of the things that you need to understand is unbelief comes in, I call it three sizes. Where did I get this? I made it up. I just looked at life and looked at stuff, looked at what people are going through and realized this is what I see. Size small is the lack of believing in God. These are people who don't believe in God at all and, or they don't believe in portions or parts of what God has declared. And why do they not believe? Because they haven't heard. They just don't know. They don't have the information. They've never been told or they've never accepted it. The smallest type of unbelief is just not believing in God. Medium. The lack of trusting God. This is where we're not trusting God to do certain things. We always take control. God asks us to do something, we go do it, but then we take back control again. And we want to conquer it. We want it back in our control, in our hands. And large is the one that we're going to be talking about today, is the lack of valuing God. Is the lack of valuing God. This is, this is where the biggest part of your unbelief comes. You live in two worlds. And I did a series that we just concluded last week called That You Are Not Only Human. 
you who believe in Jesus Christ are more than human. You have a human body, but your spirit was recreated in Jesus Christ. With your human body, you have access to the, this fallen human world that, that, is a, that with all of its blessings called sin and sickness and disease and happiness and joy and carefree and careful and anxiety and pressures and jobs and responsibility. With your body, you access this world. With your spirit, you access heavenly places in Christ Jesus. With your spirit, you, have, you actually access heavenly places. You, the Bible says that you sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Your spirit is already a citizen of heaven. You're already, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, it's not like we're waiting for you to die and figure out whether you're going to heaven or not. That's a done deal. It's already saddled, settled. It's already, the, the price has already been paid. Jesus Christ paid for it. Your spirit is a citizen in heaven. Now, because you're not just human, you live in these two worlds, there are two truths that you have constantly. Two separate truths. This world has a truth. And this, the world of the spirit has a truth as well. Neither one is wrong. They are both truths. We have truth in this world. Two plus two equals four. That's a truth. Gravity is a truth. Air is a truth. Chemistry is a truth. Your body is a truth. There's lots and lots of truths in this world. We have laws. We have different things that take place. We have a truth in this world. In the spiritual world, we also have a truth. We have just as many truths in the spirit world, and we have the greatest, biggest one that's God, where God is truth. God is the truth. The Bible talks about that he has come. He has come in the, in the spirit of truth and grace, and this is Jesus. Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. But living in these two worlds, what happens is that you, there are values you give to both worlds. And it's the value you give to the truth that you adhere to is what's going to conduct your life. And it is what's going to tell you whether you have faith or unbelief. It's going to tell you whether your faith is going to be the strong point or if your unbelief is going to be the strong point. When a truth challenges in this world, challenges the truth of God's word and God himself, you're now at a crossroads that you have to choose a value system. And if you choose the wrong value system, you could be choosing it because of unbelief. You could be having difficulty because of unbelief. You could be struggling with that because of not understanding what God has for you. Look at Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, let's go to verse 14. Let me get there. Look at verse 14. And they, this is Jesus and a couple of his disciples, came to the multitude. A man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is an epileptic and suffers severely. And he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear it with you? Bring him here to me. So Jesus basically got mad, got angry, chewed him out, raised his voice. Jesus raised his voice. He said, bring him in, bring him. And then you could just hear it. In, bring him to me. Then I told you guys to do this. Bring them to me. Then, he, then it says here, verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. So the, the child had a demon. We believe that the child's about 12 years old. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your Unbelief. The NIV says because of your lack of faith. But the Greek word there is unbelief. The Greek word that is used and translated in the King James and the New King James for the word unbelief is found 12 times in the New Testament. All 12 times it's translated unbelief. In the NIV they translated unbelief except this one time here they translated little faith. And there's a difference between unbelief and little faith. Because if you translate it as little faith, then you're looking at, I don't have enough faith, and you work on trying to have faith. The question is, 
Did the disciples have faith? These are the same guys that were put out by Jesus by twos and they went out into the different villages and cast out demons, prayed for the sick. They did marvelous things in the name of Jesus. They saw miracles happen and they came back rejoicing and they, and they even said this, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, don't get all excited that demons are subject to it. Get excited that your name's in heaven. He said, be excited that you're a citizen of heaven. Be excited that you're part of the family of God. And they, and they were all excited. So these guys are, these guys are trained in practice and experience demon caster outers. <laughs> hand lay honors. Seeing people healed. They did those things. So when a dad brought his son to them, they said, no problem, because we know we can do this. We've done it many times. We believe. And they began to pray for the boy and nothing happened. Nothing happened. Well, they had faith. Yeah, they had faith. They had faith to the point that they even tried it. They wouldn't have even tried to cast the demon out if they didn't have faith. They wouldn't have tried to say, okay, come on out. They would have, they would have, if they had no faith, they would have ran. They would have ran to Jesus. Hey, wait, wait for the, the big guy to come. But they had faith and they believed and they executed their belief and nothing happened. And then they went to Jesus privately when they saw that Jesus was able to get that demon out. And they said, so why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. We want to come back to the rest of the story at a, at a later time, but I want to hit this one point. He said, because of your unbelief. Then Jesus made this statement. This kind, he says here, for surely I say to you that if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. Jesus is not referring to that the type of demon doesn't come out by prayer and fasting. He's talked about that this kind of unbelief doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. And we'll talk about that deeper next week, but I want to go into some more things that we need to discuss today for you to get a full, clear picture of it. I want you to understand that you, again, that you live in the two worlds and you have a value system in both worlds. And when you face things in this world and that you are going to do them by the spirit or by the flesh will determine what kind of results that you have. But where does all the unbelief come from? Where does, where, where is happening? What's happening? This is where we're going to get to. In Matthew chapter 19, here's what it says. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Here's what I'd like you to understand. I told you you have two worlds and the two worlds have two truths. One of the truths in this natural world, hear me real close. One of the truths in this world is there are some things that are impossible. And that is the truth. In this world, it is impossible for a person to walk through a wall. In this world, is it impossible for a person to fly without, a, without some kind of a vehicle, helicopter, airplane, or something? In this world... There are things that are impossible. Well, one of the truths in the other world that you also have access is nothing is impossible. There is another truth. For with God, all things are possible. So God has a truth. All things are possible. This world has a truth. This world will tell you that you get certain diseases, you're going to die, they're going to put you in a terminal case, they're going to send you home, put you on hospice, they're going to tell you how many days you have left, and they're going to say that's all we can do. Because that is true. But in this world, there are other truths. In the spiritual world, there are, there's another truth, and it is just as true as this truth, that nothing's impossible for God. In this world, we see sometimes marriages that are impossible to be healed. But in this world, God says nothing's impossible. In this world, we see sometimes getting a certain career is impossible. But in this world, God says all things are possible to him who believes. 
So what do I do living in both worlds? And I'm bombarded with these facts coming into my head that's telling me it's impossible, it's impossible, it's impossible, it's impossible. And then I get a preacher telling me it's possible, it's possible, it's possible. It depends on where our value system is. What do we value? What do we put value on? And what we put value on is what li is lifted up in our lives. What we value the most, we trust the most. And what we trust are the results that we get in life itself. Now, here comes another thing is, I'd like you to understand, unbelief is valuing something more than what God has said or God's word. It is not devaluing God at all, but it is lifting some, another opinion up above God and making it more valuable. Unbelief is simply taking a value that's in this world and making it the final word. And saying, no, it can't change. I'll give you an example. The doctor has, says you have a terminal disease. You look at the doctor and you have these facts. You know the facts and the facts are true. The doctor's well-educated. The doctor's well-trained. The doctor is a specialist. He, was, he or she was recommended by your primary care doctor. In fact, you've been to three other doctors before you went to this doctor because this doctor's way up the, the food chain and is real super special and all that he or she does. And now there's, you know, the, in, you're in that person's office and the plaques are all over the place and the rewards and this person has a reputation of being smart, being really good, and just a, a, a person who cares about other people and wants to see people well. And this doctor says to you, you have five months to live. All of those truths now go into your head and go into your heart and have an impact. And you're valuing them. And it's understandable and it's, it's true. He's telling you, uh, he or she is telling you whatever it is that they've got in front of them. These are the facts. These are the truths. These are the, this is the information that you got. And you are walking out of the office and you're now going your head and your head is bombarded. What are you going to do? You're going to die and you're going to die real soon. Have you done everything you wanted to do? How are you going to tell your family? What's this going on? And all of a sudden you're just in chaos and at the same time numb to the entire world. And now you've got a choice. Is there anything over here in this spiritual world that can change this truth? I can't walk through a wall, but Jesus did. Jesus, in his spiritual resurrected body, walked through a wall, which means if he needs to walk through a wall for me, he still can do it. Is there anything, is there any word, is there any truth in the word of God is there anything that can contradict this or can change it? The thing is, what most Christians do when they, when they, talk, when they deal with, with sickness or disease in their body and they deal with a physical thing going on, that they, they want to say something like this. I'm going to make a faith statement. I believe that I am healed. And then they say, it, they, they, they feel like if I say something enough, if I say something that's not so, in order for it to be so, then eventually it will become so. And that's not what faith is. That's not how faith works. That's not how we change something. We have a fax. We have, we have disease in our body. We have pain in our body. We have sickness in our body. So is there anything that's not, I'm not saying that this isn't true. There are some other Christians who think, well, no, just pretend it's not there. Just ignore it. I can't ignore it. It's true. I hurt. And if I don't do something, I'm going to die. So what do you do in the meantime? I've got to find another truth that can miraculously change this world. And God has proven in his word that he does it all the time. Does it over and over and over and over and over and over again. He does it thousands upon thousands of times a day. Every single time a person calls on the name of the Lord and they get saved throughout this entire world and that person is born again, it's a miracle. Because this world says, you're dead and you're going to hell. But this world says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This world says, I'm going to the grave and getting old, so why don't I just do whatever I want to do? What difference does it make? This world doesn't realize that there is life after death. 
But this world, the spiritual world, is indicating and communicating clearly that there is life in Christ. And if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And when a person does, which happens many times every second of every day around this globe, the people's lives are being changed where they are dying and becoming a new creation instantly. They are becoming born again in Christ and they are, ha and it's happening instantly. Go to Matthew chapter 13 and I'll give you a story that Jesus faced and it'll prove to you where your biggest unbelief comes from. Again, it is not devaluing God, it is raising something or someone up higher than God or his word or his promise. Here's what it says in Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 53. Here's a familiar story for many people, but let's, this really tells a lot. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Now he's in his hometown. He's in his hometown where he was raised. And he comes and shows up and he, he talks about the word of God. And it's amazing. And he's talking about and testifying to the miracles that have happened before he got to this town. And then the people said this. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And then it lists his brothers and sisters. These are his half brothers and half sisters. And Mary went on, Mary and Joseph went on to have other children. They had several children after Jesus. Jesus is the oldest. Obviously, Jesus had a different father than they did. <laughs> and I know some, for some of my Catholic friends, that's brand new news to you. But yes, Joseph and Mary continue having children. And it says here, he goes, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And doesn't he have brothers? And, and list his brothers and then list his sisters. So we know he has at least two sisters because it's plural. You see, Mary's got a big family. So Jesus wasn't the only one that they were taking care of. Then listen to this, verse 56. Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended. What offended them? The knowledge of this world that were all truths. They were all true. All of it was true. That they held to be more valuable than what Jesus was declaring. Brought in on belief. Look what the Bible says. So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own uh, ex except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Their unbelief here, they, have a, they are fighting unbelief. And where did the unbelief come from? The unbelief came from the facts that they had in front of them. What was looking at them, what they were seeing, what they heard, what they experienced produced a bunch of stuff inside them. It resonated inside their minds. They had this categorized. They had this all in their brain. They knew all of this stuff and they concluded, you're not who you say you are, Jesus, because we saw you as a child. We know your family. You were raised here. All that information bombarded their brain and produced unbelief. When was it unbelief? Was it, did it, did, was it unbelief when they, when they were growing up with them? No. It was at that very moment when they were challenged with another truth. Unbelief doesn't show up. It doesn't rise up inside you on a daily basis. It rises up in the moment that you're supposed to make a choice. That's when you find out that you have it or not. That's when you realize, are you struggling with something? That's when you understand, like, what? what? People who work in the medical field, nurses, doctors, other people who work around patients a lot and exposed to a tremendous amount of information, exposed to a lot of reports and a lot of different stats and stuff, 
That's all truthful information that's helpful and they need that to do their job. But now becomes a challenge when they are facing divine healing. Because they have seen people claim inside their beds, I'm healed, I'm healed, Jesus is going to heal me, Jesus is going to heal me, and then they end up dying. Those are also truths that get uh, stuffed away somewhere in the back of the brain. Our life experiences, we are collecting information constantly. We have all this, these inputs coming into our lives, and we are now challenged on a regular basis. Are we going to just be mere mortals, mere humans, and go by all the stats and all the statistics? Or, Pastor, are you saying that I should just ignore all that information and grab all of this? No, I'm saying is that you're supposed to live in both worlds. You're supposed to use the information from this world and the information from this world and do the divine will of God. And there's a difference. A Christian does not conquer this world by ignoring it. A Christian conquers this world by knowing who they are in Christ. Every one of us face at different times of our life a level of unbelief. There are three ways for us to conquer unbelief in our life. There's three different ways that we can get unbelief out, depending on the depth of it, depending on the magnitude of it, depending on where you're at in life. Jesus told his disciples, this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. We realize that they faced an unbelief, that kind, a depth, an impasse in their life that took something spiritually, something stronger in order for them to conquer it. There are some other things that we have to do in order to conquer daily unbelief that we have to realize that uh, how many times where somebody uh, even, even gets a cold, that your first reaction, your first reaction, the very, very first thing is not prayer. Not at all. It's what medicine can I take to help conquer it. We're programmed to live in this world. We have to be programmed to live in this world as a believer. And there is a difference. So I want to teach you the three ways to conquer unbelief next Sunday. Let's close our Bibles.